Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today right before update 1.10 where we get the conservation pack we're going to be going through and having a look at some of the new animals that have come out just before that so this is obviously talking about the wonderful animals and uh, biodiversity that share the world around us and all that so quite excited to get stuck into this one as I mentioned right before the conservation pack this will be part 79 almost up to 80 and then we'll be almost up to 100 just 20 parts after that so there's clearly lots of mods and lots of people making things but um yeah we're going to be starting off with a lot of fish today we're going to be starting off with a f mod by leaf and buff uh we have got the clown loach so a really nice little fishy here where they kill a little bear bear as well let's see if you can find one swimming around not yet they're all on land feeding on this uh, we'll just have a look at you you're fun. So this is the Clown Loach, or the Tiger Bonita, or Botia, that'd be pronounced that. These guys are a tropical freshwater fish belonging to the Boed Loach family. And they're the sole member of the genus uh, Chromobonita. And they originate typically from inland waters from the islands of Sumatra and Borneo. And uh, they're a popular freshwater aquarium fish. You guys have probably seen these a lot in aquariums as little babies, but they do get quite big. As I'll mention, they get their name the clown loach because it comes from their bright colors that they have. And um, often with tropical fish, when they got stripes, they call them a clownfish. And as well as the habit of entertaining aquarium owners with their strange habits, such as playing dead or swimming upside down, which is quite cute. So information on their maximum size varies with some estimates ranging from 20 to 30 centimeters or 79, point, uh, 79 to 11 inches. While typical adult sizes actually range from 15 to 20 centimeters, so that makes them quite large, actually, or 5.927 uh, inches. And um, the, as you can see, they're quite long and laterally compressed, and they have this arched dorsal fin here. Um, and they also have this four little pairs, or four little bargels, or two pairs of bargels, that go around their mouth that allow them to feel and... Um, feel around and look for prey and things like that and they actually can actually make a clicking sound when they're happy when they're being territorial or they use it as a way of a weapon slash warning or mating so what they do is they use their pharyngeal teeth and they clap it and to create this clicking sound which is very interesting and then you can see here their body is quite uh whitish orange to reddish orange and they have these three thick bands going around their backs and they have another one going around their eye and another going around kind of their fins and things like that. And there is some color variation within um, different populations. With um, some having like in Borneo, they are pretty much like reddish to orange to black dorsal fins, pelvic fins. And then ones in Sumatrans are kind of this uh, reddish orange. So this would be one from Sumatra, it seems. Let's see if we can find one swimming now. There's got to be one swimming. There we are. He's a wonderful little fellow. And these fish, as you can see, they're quite sexual dimorphic, with the females being slightly plumpier than the males. In addition, the males will have a more uh, a tail that curves more ended, while females have the straight tips. And they have a movable spine that lies within a groove between their eyes, which actually is extended as a defended mechanism. And they can cause a painful wound with the spike, but they're luckily not venomous. And they may also be used as a predation tool as it is set close to its mouth. And as I mentioned, in terms of the habitat, oh, they're not really swimming around today, are they? Let's see if you can find one swimming. Not really. They're probably someone probably going into the water. But anyway, these guys, as I mentioned, they're found in the islands of Sumatra and Borneo, with clear stream environments providing the optimum habitat for these guys. But by annual monsoon flooding will force these guys into more flooded floodplains or murky brackish waters for about seven to eight months of the year. And these are commonly found in these floodplains in hilly areas, with breeding adults uh, migrate into similar waterways to spawn annually. In their native habitat, they typically prefer water that's a temper range, temperature range about 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, or 77 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and the pH between 5 and 8, and a water hardiness between 5 and 12 dH. Um, and in terms of reproduction and captivity, they often reproduce only after hormonal simulation of the first OEC maturation ovulation. And captive breeding and mass production of these loaches are done primarily in Europe and the country of origin in Indonesia. But um, they are 
trying to breed them more in captivity because they are at risk of being uh, overexploited in the wild if they are considered least concerned taking too many from the wild would hurt these populations but as i mentioned they're quite a popular aquarium fish and they're often uh found quite bought quite small so they get very very big and they can live up to 30 years so if you got a clown loach you need to get a big tank for it and make sure it's not housed with aggressive species but these guys will eat uh good pet uh lots of pests so they eat bananas live worms brine shrimp also eat bladder snails which are a common pest in aquaria and they typically like um good water flows and pretty generalist they just like warm water and they can um be damaged uh by rough substrates things like that but other than that they tend to be generally a pretty um uh, fit, uh, pretty good aquarium fish as long as you have a big enough tank not too hard to keep but it's still really really wonderful fish so again this wonderful fish was done by leaf and buff Sue. we're going to be moving on to the next one which is also done by leaf and buff Sue. we've got one that's something from my neck of the woods we've got the yellowtail amberjack also just known as the kingfish so uh, really interesting fish here so this is the as a, i'm just going to refer to it as a kingfish because that's what i normally call it so these are large fish that are found in the southern oceans and were previously thought to be across all oceans but these guys were split and they restricted this one to the southern hemisphere waters though they can be seen in the northern hemisphere at certain times of the year so the yellow amberjack as you can see here they kind of live in tropical and tropical waters of the southern hemisphere and the northern pacific so they can be found on australia and queensland and as far south as tasmania also found in new zealand and places like that uh, these guys also known as the yellow tail kingfish known in australia they're a highly mobile pelagic species and they tend to either form single species shoals or combine their shoals with bluefin tuna and silver trevally so they can create these large shoals and quite mobile predators really really awesome animals if I do so so myself and they prefer water temperatures of between 17 and 24 degrees celsius though in general they tend to prefer these rocky reefs and adjacent sandy areas and coastal waters and they actually occasionally will enter estuaries uh, they can be found in shallow waters down to 50 meters but have been caught at over 300 meters deep um, typically young fish uh, are up to seven kilograms and are known from shoals um, of several hundred fish where they're found at the coast while uh, adult fish tend to be found in more deep sea reefs and offshore islands with juveniles actually being really seen and they're often found far from land with floating debris and weeds which provides camouflage and the juveniles are yellow with a little thin bands uh black bands and the coloration fades once they get are about 30 centimeters in length where they get this adult coloration like this and actually very little is known about these guys biology and um, including their habits as juveniles and things like that though adults tend to live in rocky reefs outcrops and drop-offs and around offshore islands the maximum length for these guys has gotten about six feet long or 180 centimeters with large ones being caught around australia being about 40 to 50 kilograms so that's pretty big and in terms of their diet these guys are pelagic fish so they're highly active predators they usually form uh, shoals or live in pairs with their main diet consisting of bait fish including yellow fruit mackerel kawai prawns and garfish and in terms of the use in agriculture there has been some attempts to try and raise some more in agriculture because they've been suitable and they've been cultivated in japan with some groups in australia trying to cultivate them and also even in new zealand as well um, they've been trying to create sea cages and land-based uh, systems to try and uh, breed these guys so they don't take from the wild population and that's good because most uh, wild fish populations are heavily overfished to feed the demand for people so creating ways that we can breed them in captivity and farm them in aquaculture is going to be very helpful for the wild populations it basically allows us to leave them alone so yeah really really awesome fish also done by leaf and buff Zoo. so next we're moving on from some really funky fish uh, we're going to be moving on to some rays so if we look over here we have got the cow nose ray done by leaf nicholas lion rider and buff Zoo. so these guys are a species of bayonetta like ray and they can be found in a large part of the western atlantic and the caribbean so from new england united states into the um brazil but the uh east atlantic population actually being considered its own species and these guys can get quite big male rays can reach about two and a half feet in width with females typically reaching about three feet however there have been reports of uh rays getting up to seven feet in width but obviously that's reports and they these rays are often uh considered in the order 
Myolithiformes, which are shared by bat rays, manta rays, and eagle rays, so they're relative of those guys. And as I mentioned, they they typically get when they're born, they're about 11 to 18 inches or 28 to 46 centimeters wide at birth. And a mature specimen can get about 45 inches or a bit over a meter and weigh about 50 pounds. Though there have been some reports as like two meters or so being reported. And actually often mistaken by sharks, by beachgoers, sadly. And as you can see, they have this um, really interesting look to them. They have this brown back with this white or yellowish belly. And although they have this really recognizable shape and they have this really flat head and you can see these little uh, divots in the head that give them the name the cow nose ray because it kind of looks like a cow's nose and they also have a very broad head with these large mouths with lots of really um, crushing teeth and uh, dental plates that allow them to crush oysters and clams which is what they feed on and they actually have also a barb at the base of the tail that they can use for defense which can give a venom and have a toxin, but it's comparable to that of a beast thing. So unless you're allergic to it, you're typically not going to be too bad. It's going to be like a really, really bad uh, beast thing. Uh, but as I mentioned, these guys uh, feed on clams and oysters and other invertebrates. And they use these two modified um, fins on its front side to produce suction and allows them to be drawn to the mouth. And then that's crushed under the... Uh... Let's see if we can have a look at this one swimming under here usually crushed under that mouth, so which is really cool. And they actually typically swim in groups, and they use these synchronized wind flaps to stir up the sediment and expose these clams and oysters to feed on. And they either prefer to feed on early morning hours or late afternoon hours, so they're um, kind of crepuscular. And when the waves are calm and visibly high during the day, uh, they'll often do that as well. And the Kaunas Row have these extremely big jaws with these robust teeth that have a hardness comparable to cement that allow them to eat these hard shells as well. So in terms of predation, these guys are quite high up on the food chain, so they're typically not preyed upon by much, but they are also preyed upon by humans, cobia, and uh, hammerhead sharks. And in terms of their reproduction and lifespan... Uh, sexual maturity for both males and females has reached about four or five years old and in the Gulf of Mexico females can live up to about 18 years and males only live for about 16 years. So in terms of breeding uh, they typically breed from April through October with a large school of cow nose rays gathering from various ages and sections in the shallow waters where the females will swim along the edge sticking out of the water with a pelvic fin or pectoral fins and the males will come and try and grasp the uh, mate as well. So in terms of the embryo, they grow within the mother with the wings folded over their body. Initially, they are nourished by an egg yolk, although there's uterine secretions uh, that are secreted by the mother that they will subsist upon later in development. And the length of gestation is kind of a little bit disputed for these guys, but it is estimated to be about 11 to 12 months. And at full term, the off offspring is born live and obviously tail first. And as I mentioned, these guys also migrate. They often migrate from the Gulf of Mexico to Trinidad, Brazil, and kind of follow these patterns with the Atlantic migration consisting moving north in late spring and south in late fall. So they avoid these patterns. And um, migration might actually be influenced by the orientation of the sun and water temperatures as well. And actually southern migrations may be influenced by southern orientation, uh, solar orientation, and the change in water temperature. And they've also been seen in areas such as Maryland and Virginia and seen migrating in Schoolin. And it's actually not uncommon to see them swim near the surface, despite mostly feeding on the bottom. And they can be tracked by um, airplane, as it's easy to see these shells, and also obviously GPS and things like that. And they've actually been reported in the inland waters of the mid-Atlantic island of Bermuda. And as I mentioned, these guys are typically found within the eastern and western Atlantic Ocean, with the eastern found that can be found around... Well, not the eastern side, from Florida, Brazil, places like that, where they live in brackish marine habitats and dips up to 72 feet or 22 meters. And they're social creatures living in these large shoals, as I mentioned. And in terms of their conservation status, it's kind of sad. They're listed as vulnerable due to extensive overfishing in the Caribbean. Though in the Gulf of Mexico and along the coast of North America, it's not quite as threatened there. But the species has experienced some pretty deep population declines with the population declining about 30 to 49 percent in only 43 years and Kaunos ray killing competitions have been banned in Maryland which is also very very good uh, let's see if we can have a look at these guys and they don't have pose a very big risk to humans as I mentioned they um, typically will lash out with the tails but it's no worse than a beast thing and um, in terms of fishing 
one solution is to um to obviously kill them and overpopulation in some areas uh, often causes um oyster beds to become depleted and but that's obviously very selective and with this population decline it's obviously not going to be very good uh and but luckily they are kept in a lot of aquariums they're quite common in touch tanks because people quite obviously like to come and pat them and things like that and they're held in aquariums all across the world so um yeah really really awesome fish again done by leaf nick and buff Zoo. and next we're going to move on to another really cool fish we have got the great barracuda so uh another one nice one this was done by genora pizza uh and buff Zoo. yep just making sure a really really awesome fish here so uh the great barracuda these guys are present typically in subtropical parts of the indian uh pacific and atlantic oceans from deep reefs to mangroves with a depth limit of about 110 meters and they've been reported to be declining in florida which is uh, why they've imposed catch limits and they're actually as the name implies they're the great barracuda they're typically one of the largest barracuda species. Mature specimens can measure about 60 to 100 centimeters or 29 to 39 inches in length and weigh about 2 to 2.5 to 9 kilograms or 5 to 19 pounds. With exceptionally large specimens getting about 1.5 meters or 4 foot 9 and over 23 kilograms. And there's record specimens of about 46 kilograms or 100 pounds and 1.7 meters or 5.6 with even reports of being about two meters and even three meters, but obviously that's kind of hearsay sometimes. People just like to exaggerate sometimes. So um, these guys typically, they can see they're blue and gray with this chalky white on them, and they have this row of bands going along them. And they have a elongated body with these powerful jaws, which they use to catch prey. And um, they also have a, give them like a pike-like appearance. And you can see they also have a large swim bladder that allows them to uh, dive and uh, move around the water pretty effectively. Really, really nice long fish. Long, elongated, perfect build for, build for predator. And as they like to live on the ocean seas, they are voracious predators. So they hunt and ambush, things like that. And they rely on sudden bursts of speed, which can be up to 27 miles per hour or 43 kilometers per hour to catch their prey. And um, they will sacrifice maneuverability for this. And they're more or less solitary and their habits and young and half-grown fish will congregate in these schools and barracuda can often live to at least 14 years of age and uh, their spawning season lasts from april to october where females can release between 5,000 and 30,000 eggs uh, which is a lot and their diets typically consist because since the top of the reef they eat almost pretty much fish cephalopods and occasionally shrimp and large barracuda may attempt to herd a school of prey fish into shallow water until they are ready for another hunt and guard them. So that's pretty cool. Let's see if we can find another one swimming around. There we are. Beautiful, beautiful fish. So in terms of relationship with humans, these guys are scavengers, and many mistake them for large predators, followed by the hopes of eating the remains of their prey. Um, and swimmers often reported being bitten by barracuda, but they're rare and it's possibly caused by poor visibility with mistaking objects that glint and shine for prey. Though um, these attacks on humans are rare, these bites can cause serious lacerations and loss of soft tissue. Um, there's a popular target for recreational fishing and do their strong fight when they're hooked. However, they are not very good to be eaten and they get fish poisoning uh, when eaten. So typically they don't eat this fish, but still a really, really wonderful animal really really cool uh also done as i mentioned by genoa pizza and buff Zoo. so next we're going to move on to the atlantic swordfish so just kind of your regular swordfish uh really really awesome um also done by buff Zoo, genoa pizza and jen so let's have a wonderful look at these guys these are the atlantic swordfish so also known as broadbills they're highly uh, migratory fish and they have these long pointed bills it kind of gets the name the swordfish so this fish is found pretty much worldwide as part of the atlantic pacific and indian oceans and can typically found in near the surface at depths of 550 meters and up to depths of about 2000 through 234 meters and they get quite big your average specimen they typically reach about three meters long and a maximum weight uh, record has been 4.5 meters so between 10 and 14 feet long or 50 even 50 feet long and the big weight has been considered about 650 kilograms or 1430 pounds so females are typically quite a bit larger than males and the pacific swordfish they reach a greater size than north atlantic and mediterranean swordfish 
and they reach maturity about four to, four to five years old, and their maximum age is believed to be about nine years. And the oldest swordfish found in a recent study was a 16-year-old female and a 12-year-old male. And um, these are derived from the annual rings on their fin rays or rather than ulas, since the ulas are quite small. And um, similar to a lot of sharks, and uh, I mentioned last time the Ofa. These guys are endothermic animals, and these guys have special organs near their eyes that allow them to heat their eyes and brain, so they're able to operate at temperatures uh, slightly warmer than the surrounding water about them, typically at about 10 to 15 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, or 18 to 27 degrees around, higher than the surrounding water. And the heating of the eyes greatly improves their vision and allows them to catch prey much easier. So this is a female. Let's have a look at the younger males. Look at these little guys. Fun. And out of the 250,000 known fish species, only 22 are uh, known to have this mechanism. It includes the swordfish, marlin, tuna, and shark species. So in terms of their movement, they it's believed that they use their sword as a spear, but it's actually not the case. They actually often use it to um, kind of offensive spear so but that's even like, considered what they typically do is they use it to kind of shoal fish and uh, potentially even whack fish sometimes but they don't spear fish and they rely on their great ability agility and speed to catch their prey and they're actually no doubt among the far uh, fastest fish with estimates being quoted about 100 kilometers per hour 60 miles per hour is um, unreliable but based on marlin is about 20 36 kilometers or 22 <coughs> miles per hour consider more likely but also these guys are not really shoaling fish and they tend to swim alone or in loose aggregations separated by a bunch of 10 meters and they can be found basking at the surface with their dorsal fin up as well and they report seeing these guys jumping out of the water or breaching which is um believed to be an effort to try and get rid of parasites or remoras on their body they are really really cool animals Though these guys typically prefer water between 18 and 22 degrees, or 64 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, they have the widest tolerant, uh, tolerance to these temperatures among the billfish, so they can be found even in waters from 5 to 27 degrees, or 41 to 81 degrees Fahrenheit. And they're quite migratory species, so they move to uh, colder areas to feed during the summer, and they move back to warmer areas during the winter. And they feed on a wide range of fish. Uh, they would typically feed on mackerels, barracuda, rockfish, lanternfish, squid, crustaceans, pretty much whatever they can find. And really, really awesome. So in the North Pacific, they typically will spawn in waters warmer than about 24 degrees Celsius or 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, typically not too deep as well. And they larger females can carry more eggs than the smaller females. So they have a look at the little babies while we're talking about them. Well, this is an adult, but it's all right. So typically, as I mentioned, large females have a lot more eggs, and there could be between 1 million and 29 million eggs, and these pelagic eggs can be about 1.6 to 1.8 millimeters in diameter. And these guys, small larvae, they can get about 4 millimeters, and they typically live on the surface, and they look very different from the adults. And the bill is evident at about 1 centimeter in length, and that's when they start to grow their big bill. So in terms of fisheries, these guys are harvested from a variety of methods on the small scale including like long line fishing, uh, harpoon fishing as well, and the vigorous powerful fighters, which means that they often are quite common for uh, uh, commercial fisheries or fishermen to try and catch them. Um, there have been some reports of people being killed by like um, swordfish, uh, but that's mainly by accident. They might just run into you and stab you, for example. But in terms of recreational, they're quite um, common in that regard, but they are... Obviously, they are considered least concerned, but a lot of other concerns of overfishing and things like that would also apply to this species. So, really awesome to see this swordfish, again done by Genora Pizza and Buffsu. So, next we've got an extinct animal that we've kind of covered before in Jurassic World Evolution, but still a really wonderful animal to talk about regardless. We have got Leedsichthus, so wonderful big fish. So, Leedsichthus is an extinct genus of... Um, Pachycormid fish, which lived in the middle to late Jurassic, so about like 160, 150 so million years ago, and is the largest known ray finned fish, and among the largest fish ever to exist. So the first remains of Leesixus were identified in the 19th century, which was um, identified by the British collector um, Alfred Nicholson Leeds, who was, gave the genus to lead fish in 1889, with the type specimen, uh, the type species being Leesixus problematicus 
though there have also been fa- fossils of us been found in England, Gra- uh, France, Germany, and Chile. And there was another species described on the Chile, spe- Chile specimens, but they were later shown to be indistinguishable from our big guy here. So, because these guys have been difficult, because uh, they have a, not completely made a bone, a lot of their bones are made of cartilage, makes them very hard to interpret their bodies. But it seems that these guys uh, have a very big estimate. There have been estimates of their size about 9 meters being plausible, but um, at the end, there was often claimed to be over like the size of a little whale, 30 meters long, but those are considered quite erroneous and over the top. But recent research has kind of agreed upon that these guys were about 16 meters or about 52 in, uh, feet in the largest individual, so a size comparable to humpback whales. And um, skull bones from these uh, animals have been indicate these guys had large heads with bonies, with bosses along the uh, skull roof. And they also show they have these large elongated pectoral fins and vertical tail fins, which help for swimming. And they have these large gill rakers, which uh, shows their uh, ecology. So these guys were large filter feeders. They would use um, open their mouths and use these gill rakers to filter out food for them to eat. So things like plankton and small animals like that which is also really cool. And as I mentioned, they're just such a huge animal. And they're in this extinct group of um, animals called um, Pacumayids, and we don't really know this, where they are. Some would consider them to be very uh, basal teleos fish, and if so, that would make lead sectors the very large just teleos fish. But they're also in a group of uh, Pachycorminiforms, which is kind of sister to or next to that group and some have been considered them even baseful uh, basal and even put them next to bowfish as well which is the common living most common living relative of lead sickness uh, in terms of that and in terms of the paleobiology their ecology would have been very similar to animals such as whale sharks basking sharks where they use these gill rakers to filter up plankton and zooplankton and things like that and um they actually, as well, they suggested that these guys may have been spouting water through their mouths and disturbing beatnik things, feeding kind of like grey whales. But there was attributed to um, uh, plesiosaurs, but either hypothesis is possible. But there's really not much known about these guys. So, But there has been studies into the life cycle that shows that these guys were had a high metabolism. And is no one really knows how they increase their size quickly during the first year of life so it may have been quite a long time these guys could have been quite long lived to get to those big sizes of 16 meters so the size of a humpback whale and another really cool thing as well is that they've been found the presence of a tooth in the marine crocodile Metrorhynchus as well and um the bones seem to have healed um in terms of the original analysis but in terms of but in 2007 it showed that these guys may have been scavenged upon by uh, Metrorhynchus which is a type of marine crocodile and if you guys have seen uh, Sea Monsters with Nile Ma- Nigel Marvin, you guys will know that. But in reality, it's actually a scavenge of a dead animal. And these guys may have been um, large enough to um, avoid the attacks from animals such as Leoplorodon, which lived with it. And um, another really cool thing as well, is there's a lot of convergent evolution with these guys. So these guys were kind of the beginning of a long line of these large um, paracomide suspension feeders, which flourished into the late Cretaceous with relatives such as um, Boronicthes and Rhinoconicthes, which were late relatives of these guys. And they seem to have had this evolutionary path that was quite similar to uh, baleen whales and being large suspension feeders. So really, really cool fish. And um, recent studies have actually uncovered that the metabolic rate of these guys could have been very interesting and these guys would have cruised at potential speeds about 11 miles per hour or about 17 kilometers per hour while they're still able to maintain the oxidization of their muscle tissues so yeah really really cool fish and this is definitely more accurate than the original one which was just the walking with dinosaurs one but look at this cute little baby such huge remember this is the size of a humpback whale but it's a fish so that really gives you the size and this mod was done by i forgot to mention at the beginning leaf Jaserba and Buffsu, as Jaserba made the model for Jurassic World Evolution too, but luckily um, they ported it over to Jurassic World Evolution, I mean, from Jurassic World Evolution to Planet Zoo, so I'm able to show you guys this uh, wonderful mod off like this. So, um, really, really awesome. Next, we've got, all the from even from the fishes, we've got a bird. So we have got the Black Stork uh, by Ginger Toast, a really wonderful bird here. So we can see these wonderful guys. The black stork. Uh, these guys are a large stork in the family Chikonidae. 
and they measure on average between 95 to 100 centimeters or 37 to 39 inches from beak tip to the end of the tail and about 45 to 55 centimeters wingspan so 57 to 61 inches and they get their name black stork from this mostly black plumage that they have with the white underparts a long pointed red beak and eyes and also long red legs and these guys are widespread but uncommon and they're breeds in um, scattered locations across the paleoarctic and the east of the pacific ocean and they breed around like portugal spain central eastern parts of europe as far as south as east across the paleoarctic to the pacific ocean and these guys are also are long distant migrants with european populations wintering in tropical sub-saharan africa and asian populations in india and when migrating migrating between europe and africa they avoid crossing the mediterranean sea and they often will go through the strait of gibraltar and why live in it to the east and um there's also an isolated non-migratory population that lives in southern africa so they're quite a wide ranging species they basically found all across the um uh, they found lots of areas in africa also all across europe and asia so quite a wide ranging species and unlike the closely related white stork um, these guys are a shy and wary species these guys were typically seen singly or in pairs and usually live in marshy areas and rivers and uh, wetlands and things like that and they feed on amphibians, small fish, and insects, where they generally wade slowly to catch their prey. Um, breeding pairs typically will usually build their nests in large forest areas, most commonly deciduous but also coniferous forests, which can be seen for long distances, as well as on, on large boulders or overhanging ledges and mountainous areas. And uh, the female will typically lay between two to five greenish-white eggs, and due to um, well, which will become soiled over time, Typically, incubation takes about 32 to 38 days, with both parents, uh, parents uh, sharing duties and fledging will take place at about 60 to 20, 71 days. And so these guys, although they're uncommon, they are considered a species of least concern by the IUCN, but their actual status is kind of, we don't really know. Um, they have a large range and they're nowhere abundant, but they seem to be declining in parts of their range, such as Western Europe, uh, India and China. Though they could be increasing in some areas such as the Iberian Peninsula, with a bunch of conservation efforts across the areas where they live, um, trying to uh, take and breed and obviously have conservation plans in place. And they're also protected by the uh, African-Eurasian water, uh, water Bird Agreement and the Convention of or CITES, or the Convention of International Trade in Dacent Species of Wild Flora and Fauna. So yeah, a really, really interesting animal. And as I mentioned, they have huge migrations. They migrate basically from Europe into Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, so places such as like um, West Africa, um, places like that. Very, very cool animals. Um, I believe that, let's have, what's the estimated population? I don't really see it here. It's estimated to have declined, but that's about it. But yeah, really, really wonderful species. And look at these cute little babies. Really, really wonderful. So it's really nice to get a, another cool stork done by ginger toast really really came out wonderfully so second to last we have got the by leaf and squash we have got not only a couple we got a mammal we got a lemur who doesn't love a nice lemur so we have got here the common brown lemur by leaf and squash so these guys are only found in madagascar like most lemurs or pretty much all lemurs but have been introduced to uh, mayonnaise uh, these guys, the common brown lemur is typically about 84 to 101 centimeters long, or about 33 to 40 inches, with a 40 to 51 centimeter long tail, um, which is about 16 to 20 inches. Weights for these guys typically range for about 22 to 3 kilograms, or 4 to 6 pounds. And you can see their short, dense fur is primarily quite brown and gray, grayish brown, which gets their name. And in fact, uh, their faces, you can see here, they're... Um, kind of crowned with dark gray or black with pale eyes and the eyes you can see are orange orange red there really interesting look to them so similar species to these guys include like the mongoose lemur and the red-bellied lemur but they can obviously be distinguished from these guys and they do overlap and hybridize with the white fronted brown lemur in their range so they have a pretty large range they occupy a bunch of forest types such as rainforests that are lone tain and mountain rainforests um and also evergreen deciduous forests, where they spend 95% of their time in the upper layers of the forest and spend less than 2% of their time on the ground. In terms of their 
social life. They typically live in groups of between 5 and 12, but group sizes can be larger, and the groups will typically occupy a home range of about 1 to 9 hectares in the west, but can be more than 20 in the east. And these groups will include members of both sexes, including juveniles, but there's uh, no kind of dominance hierarchy there, so they basically just all live in communally. You know how that is. So, um... They also primarily active during the day, and they can exhibit uh, carthermal behavior and continue into the night, especially during full, full moons or in the dry season to find more food. And in the western part of their range, they often overlap with the mongoose lemur and the other two species, uh, and these two species sometimes travel together. And in the areas of this overlap, they often adapt their activity patterns to avoid conflict. <coughs> I'm sorry, that's a bit of a cough, but anyway. For example, the mongoose lemur can be primarily but nocturnal during the dry season, dry season in this area of overlap. And in terms of their reproduction, uh, we'll have a look at the cute little babies while we talk about reproduction. Look at this little man, how cute is he? But um, common brown lemur's mating season is between May and June, and they have a gestation period about 120 days, with the young being born during September and October. Single births are most common, but twins have been reported, and the young are weaned after about four to five months uh, of being born, and with sexual maturity reaching about um, 18 months, where the female will give birth to her first baby at about two years old, and their lifespan has been estimated to be quite long, about 30 plus years, so that's also very interesting. And in terms of their diet, these guys typically feed on fruits, young, in, uh, young flowers, and young leaves. But they actually have been known to eat lots of invertebrates, such as cicadas, spiders, and uh, millipedes. They also will eat bark, sap, soil, and red clay, which allow them to tolerate greater levels of toxic compounds uh, of plants that other lemurs can't eat. So that gives them a competitive advantage in that regard. And in terms of their range, they're typically found in western and eastern parts of Madagascar. And they have been a population that's been introduced there on the island of Mayanet, which is just kind of off the coast of uh, western Madagascar, a little bit more north. Uh, but yeah, really, really cool animals. And Leaf and Squash did a really wonderful job with these guys. You can see that's the male and the female. The male is a little bit darker than the females and um, still looks really, really wonderful. So yeah, next we're going to be covering probably the most downloaded mod who got a remake because of obviously the wetland pack having the really cute little um, uh, Asian small clawed otter. Uh, so we've got the North American otter. So really, really awesome. This guy was done by Leaf, Nicholas, Lion Rider, and Jen. So we're going to have a look at these wonderful guys here. So the North American river otter, also known as just the river otter or the northern river otter, they're a semi-aquatic mammal that only lives in North America along its coasts and waterways. And these guys can get quite big. An adult North American river otter can get between 5 and 14 kilograms or about 11 to 13 pounds. And in terms of their body length, they can reach about uh, 66 to 107 centimeters or 26 to 42 inches and um, tail lengths will reach about 30 to 50 centimeters so they're um, typically a little bit um, leaner and and um, they get about 15 kilograms on largest but they're typically a little bit leaner and meaner than their um, um, Eurasian counterparts and um, yeah really really cool and they often have this really thick fur that a lot of other eel uh, not eels um, other otters have that allow them to defend from or protect them and insulate them from water so they don't get cold and obviously keeps them warm keeps water out all of that so these guys are a type of weasel or otter of course and they are versatile both on land and in water as you can see they often establish a bar along the water's edge with a lake or coastline tidal flap or estuary they're typically not that um <laughs> discriminative in that regard uh but they typically these dens will have large openings and many openings as well um that allows them to uh, generally allow the otter exit into different bodies, parts of the body of water. And female river otters typically give birth in these burrows, and they will have litters of about two to six, uh, one to six individuals, which we'll have a look at here. They're just so cute. Look at these cute little baby otters. How adorable. Really cool that we got to see a wonderful one of these guys. I want to see one hanging out there. Look at how cute these little baby otters are. Look how adorable. As we talk about that, these guys uh, will eat whatever they can find, really. They typically eat a lot of fish, but they'll also eat lots of amphibians, such as uh, salamanders and frogs. Freshwater clams they'll eat as well, uh, mussels, small turtles, snails, and crayfish. 
And the most common fish these guys will eat are perch, suckers, and catfish. And occasional reports have been seen to eat other small animals, even dogs, um, squirrels, birds, and mice. They've even been reported to attack. And the range of North American river otters has sadly greatly reduced due to habitat loss, which began with the colonization by the Europeans of um, the Americas. Though in some reasons their populations is controlled by trapping and harvesting for fur, um, North American river otters are also very susceptible to uh, environmental pollution, so obviously people dumping uh, toxins and uh, plastic into the water is not going to help them. And they have likely contributed, that's likely contributed to a lot of the declines around their range. But there's luckily been a lot of uh, reintroduction efforts to help their population recover from that. And there's just been a lot of reintroduction efforts. And um, they used to be a lot less common than they were. They used to be extirpated from basically the Midwest and East United States because of people. Uh, and the decline through large portions of that, but there has been lots of efforts to bring them back through captive breeding and reintroduction efforts, which is a really cool example of how well that they've done. Um, kind of like the bison as well, they're great examples of how conservation works well, and they've been able to spread back out. But um, major threats to these guys include habitat degradation and pollution, as they're highly sensitive to that, so things like mercury, um, plastics, and things like that as well. So yeah, still a vulnerable species, but doing a, okay now. Um, they're at least concerned, so obviously they're, they're not at risk of extinction, but still sensitive to a lot of things. So people need to make sure to take care of their local waterways for these guys if you live in America. But yeah, really, really awesome. So um, yeah, again, this mod was done by a Leaf, Nicholas, Line, uh, Ryder, and Jim. All did a wonderful job. Everyone today has done a wonderful job with these mods. So, um, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye-bye.